Welcome aboard what looks very much like an airliner cockpit with steering gear operated like a joystick. Well, we are planing in a vessel that is flying blind. This is the hydroplane position and wheelhouse of the Royal Navy's first nuclear-powered submarine, HMS Dreadnought. Even aboard one of the Navy's most modern fighting vessels, time-honored rituals are still keenly observed. Perhaps because a ship called Dreadnought sailed with Drake in 1573. Dreadnought's certainly a name to conjure with. There have been Dreadnoughts that fought the Spanish and Napoleon. Some ended their days as hospitals, even prison ships. None was more famous than the 18,000-ton battleship that upset the balance of power at sea before the Great War. Drinking to tradition is important aboard the Atomic Age's own revolution in sea power. So is the everyday, every hour business of getting on watch in a ship that must combine economy of space with a maximum freedom of movement for the 90 plus officers and ratings. Dreadnought can steam submerged for months at a time. Space and the way it's used is priceless. They say men get used to anything in time, but to work without daylight or landfall, there must be compensations. And there are. Life can be cozy enough, but there are hazards. Anti-radiation precautions must be strictly enforced before anyone enters that secret nuclear reactor compartment. A ship on long-range duty has to be much more than a fighting vehicle, more than a home. If an aircraft carrier is a floating city, a submarine is an underwater village. You could call this Dreadnought's village shop. And like any living unit of any size, there's the rubbish problem. Dreadnought's designers have crushed the waste problem down to disposable size. The gash ejector, the atomic age dustbin. Ditching gash, as submariners call it, is carried out with the same urgency as any other naval operation. And it's holed to sink without leaving a telltale trail behind. Dreadnought on watch protects the fleet, the epitome of 20th century armored mobility, a submerged arsenal that can move anywhere at any time. Britain's defense role may not be the same as it was in the days of the Dreadnought battleships, but as the armed forces contract, so they intensify their strike at mobility. The submarine, more than anything, is the symbol of the Navy's new role. Fast, compact, self-reliant. There are other challenges taken up by naval ingenuity. Everything is adaptable, economical, almost spare. Kitchens may be mini-sized, but appetites are traditionally big. Feeding the inner man is tackled with the same kind of fold-away common sense. The atomic village has its own version of the local lending library. Duty-free for some, but there are always chores to be done. Dreadnought's mini laundry is always tumbling into action. Nuclear power of the kind that drives Dreadnought may be the eventual cheap provider of energy to the world, but nuclear weapons have brought ambiguity to defense. 
The services act as nuclear deterrents designed to prevent full-scale conflict. But at the same time, they're prepared to engage in conventionally deployed tactical operations. So the Navy is equipped with the Polaris submarine deterrent and the dreadnought, policemen of the fleet. Supervising action operations, Commander Cobb. Dreadnought, guided by computer, uses the most sophisticated long-range sonar submarine detection system and is armed with self-homing torpedoes. The submarine role is as versatile as it is manoeuvrable. There are more than 40 hunter-killer patrol subs. Three dreadnought fleet protectors in service and three planned. Four of the Polaris type make up the Navy's varied complement of undersea strength. 